It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Umesh Kumar, whom we consider as a part of our NTM family. We collaborate with him on different fronts, whether it is related to reviewing, writing articles, or giving a lecture. Regarding his credentials, Dr. Umesh is a faculty in the Department of English, Banaras Hindu University. He is a practicing translator and works either ways with English, Hindi, and Marathi. His passion lies in translation studies, Indian literature, and children's literature. He has training background from some of the leading translation schools of the world, notably Nida School of Translation Studies, Italy, and the British Center for Literary Translation University of East Anglia, UK. He has, to his credit, many essays, articles, and translations, which have appeared in reputed publications like Sahitya Academy, Translation Today, Sage Publications, The Hindu, Vani Prakashan, The Wire, The Book Review, and many more. He has, he is a visiting fellow to some of the renowned universities of the world, as well as in India. Surely, as Dr. Thomas also acknowledged about him yesterday, he is one of the promising scholars in academics and translation. I must mention that he is one of the highly rated experts of our training programs, and I'm sure you all will also enjoy his lecture. Welcome, Dr. Umesh Kumar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sunitra Ji, and thank you, NTM and MCC, for inviting me. I also uh, say my formal hello to Professor Gridhar, who uh, is one of our very favorite people at NTM as well. So the kind of introduction that Sunitra has given must have raised the bar of expectations. I'm not sure how far I can match up to that expectation. But what I will do today is to give uh, a very basic introduction. Uh, and my purpose is very political. In trying to give this introduction, I'm also trying to lure the young students who are doing their uh, bachelor's degree and other programs in uh, MCC towards translation. And if you could see, the title of my talk is uh, Doing Translation, a Beginner's Introduction. So uh, usually we speak to a, a group of people who usually have MA degrees and so on and so forth. So this is the first time that I'm speaking to a very young audience. And I would actually begin with an anecdote. And uh, this is my personal experience. And I'm also a great uh, admirer of personal anecdotes because personal anecdotes have this ability to connect the personal with the wider and the personal with the political as well. So when I was uh, very small, when I was in my second standard or so, I used to live in Haryana with my mother. And my father was a serving soldier in Indian Army those days. And it would look a little obsolete to our audience today. But when I was growing up, the best method to communicate with distant people was to write letters to them. And we used to call them as inland letters. So my father would uh, write letters to us in the village. And unfortunately, my mother had never been to school. Uh, she is illiterate. So the duty usually would be uh, with, uh, with children to answer those letters of my father. And naturally, when the letter would arrive, they would read the letter to the mother. And after listening to the letter, mother would actually speak three, four sentences, uh, which would be the core of her reply to my father. And it would be the duty of a, a student of second standard or third standard to 
convert those two three sentences into a full fledged letter and uh, the thing is that my mother would speak in my mother language she would speak in haryanvi and i have to write the letter in standard hindi because it is not only the test of my writing skill but it is also the test of the skill of the fact that i am going to a school so i remember that i would take the uh, notebook and i would convert those three four sentences into a full fledged letter at the back of my notebook and i would read that letter to my mother and quite often my often my mother would be very dissatisfied with what i have written she would ask me to revise it because she would say that i have not been able to communicate what she wanted to say properly she would never say she would never pinpoint as to where the problem is but she would be dissatisfied with what i have written and then i would write the second draft and third draft so my mother would ask me to revise uh, the letter and she she would be very particular whether i am able to communicate the message in the real terms and so and so forth retrospectively after almost uh, you know these 20 20 years i realized that these were my first lessons in translation because i was translating my mother's thought into writing and then was also revising what i have done three four times before it was sent to my father so translation by this anecdote i wanted to say that when we hear that we are doing a workshop on translation the feeling that comes to us is that we are actually doing something uh very important which requires training and of course it does but the point is that translation experience is never away from us so much so that in india we actually live in and live through translation uh for example when you come to your classroom when you speak to a teacher quite often you translate your own uh, mother language into a language that your teacher and your peers uh, can understand so first of all please be away from this uh, idea that translation is very alien to you our indian tradition would say the indian poetic tradition would say that uh the speech that comes out as the output itself is a translation because whatever was there in your mind you have translated it into a speech so speech itself is a translation uh i'm not going into a uh, greater depth of what uh, that idea is but the concept of uh, para pashyanti madhyama and vaikhari is an example of how the indian tradition also understands uh, in theoretical terms what translation is where speech itself is an act of translation however my purpose today is to give you a basic sort of idea as getting into translation as a practitioner when we talk about translation there are different ways through which you can actually become part of the translation process and translation projects so when you say translation you could be a translate translation reviewer you could be a translation theorist you could be a translation practitioner you could be a translation historian so you could do a variety of things with translation and i'm not talking about translation historians i'm not talking about translation theorists i'm not talking about translation reviewers i'm talking about uh, with my own experience as a translation practitioner so what i mean by a translate translation practitioner uh if you could see my title you would see that i'm talking about doing translation and this word doing is very important to me if you see the dictionary meaning of the word doing you will get many ideas first of all doing is also about action doing is also about uh, doing something uh with some kind of diligence sometimes you must have also heard this phrase it will take some doing 
So translation is also in the formal sort of structure, takes some doing. It is not an easy exercise, although this could be a lot of, uh, it could give you a lot of satisfaction and all that. So I'm talking about doing in the sense as to how you can enter into translation procedure, translation field. So when we talk about a translated book, uh, I have two of them. When I talk about a translate, translated book, I'm also saying something else. I'm also saying that a book has been translated. Somebody has translated it. Somebody has published it. And somebody potentially is also going to read it. Although about the last bit, we are not sure. But these are the major stakeholders involved into a translate translation practitioners cosmos okay so you have a book you have a publisher you have a person who does translation the translator and also the translation reader and in next 25 30 minutes i am going to talk about all these stakeholders although not in a very chronological order because I believe that there is no chronology involved in it as such. Although we are all habitual to chronologies, but I'm using these particular opportunities. I'm using these stakeholders as different charts in my front of, in front of my eyes. And I'm going to sprinkle some, some ink here and there. And we'll see at the end whether we can make some sense out of this non-chronological sort of discussion. The first is that how you get into translating a book. How do you know that you are a potential translator? Uh, there is no clear cut answer to this. Uh, it depends upon the kind of love and passion that you have for a particular text. So when I'm talking about literary translation, I'm also not talking about so many other translations. So when I'm talking about literary translation, I'm not talking about, say, uh, what NDM is very fond of, the knowledge text translation, or uh, translation in medicine, translation in engineering, translation in technology, and so on and so forth. I'm talking primarily about literary translation, where I'm, in other words, I'm talking about translating a short story, or a poem, or a novel, or a, or a one-act play, or something like that. So I'm primarily talking about literary translation in that sense. So why you translate? Why you must translate? These are the questions that have an answer emerging from your own self. Okay. I will give you a very simple example. There is a wonderful writer called Isaac Basavi Singer. You must have heard his name. Uh, he's actually a Nobel laureate. And he wrote wonderful stories. And one of my old time favorite story, one of my old time favorite stories is Gimple the Fool. Okay. Uh, if you have not read it, please uh, read this short story by Singer. When you read Gimple the Fool, when I read Gimple the Fool for the first time, I was blown away by the ability of the writer to create a character who, in spite of the fact that so much distant from us, is able to speak to us. Now, Gimple the fool is not an ordinary fool. He is actually a holy fool. And please don't understand holy fool only in the sense of Christianity. Of course, uh, you will be able to see those connections. But when I read that story for the first time, my first reaction was, and of course, very narcissist, that if I like this story that much, somebody else would also like it. So why you want to translate it? Because you believe that if somebody has moved you, and that is, of course, one of the primary purposes of any great literature, that it should be able to move you, uh, irrespective of your geography and irrespective of your social condition and reality. It should be able to move you. And when I read it in my BA and later on when I read it in my MA, I realized that the story is always growing as an influence on my mind. 
So when you read something that moves you, the best compliment that one can pay is to translate it. Because as other experts in the uh, group would agree, that translation, when you do translation, translation is the closest reading that you can do for a text. When you read, you are bound to miss certain nuances. But when you translate, you do the closest reading. And there you establish with the text the most intimate connections. So that is the first consideration for any budding translator, that you must translate when you feel that you have been moved by the text. Because if I do not see Gimple the Fool in Hindi, if I do not see Gimple the Fool in Marathi, two of the languages that I operate in, I would consider that my languages are poorer without Gimple the Fool. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that translation is also the medium to bring the best that the world literature has to offer in our languages. And at the same time, translation is also the method through which we can showcase the best that we have. So in other words, translation is the only bridge. And that's why I agree with Professor Giridhar a number of times when he says that nothing is untranslatable. In the sense that if you feel that you cannot translate Gimple the Fool, a very challenging text, and translated by none other than Bello himself, who is a great American writer. So my point is that translation is the bridge through which we connect the global with the local and the local with the global. That's the, you know, that's the funda for today's life in the globalized world. We often talk about, you know, bridging these connections. And if you leave out Indian sort of setting, you'll find that many people who, who have gone on to achieve the uh, major prizes in literature, uh, quite a few of them have been translated writers. So translation is, if I say that translation is an important exercise, that would be an understatement, so to speak. It is very difficult to define as to what kind of capacity and what kind of power that it holds. So when we talk about becoming Vishu Guru, I wonder how we could turn into a Vishu Guru without getting to understand the power and importance of translation. I often argue with uh, some of our friends that we talk about 20 people will come together and they would say that they have established an industry. They have established a chamber or something like that. But we have never seen an industry of translators in India. We do not have a university that is exclusively dedicated to translation practice or translation exercise in our country. And this is baffling in the sense that this country, this space that houses so many languages is the most fertile ground for translation exercise. So as students who are growing up, you have to understand that, I mean, I'm a practicing translator, so I would definitely argue for it that translation is a very potent force to assert your identity. And the, the, the problem that I see is that although so much of work is being undertaken in translation in India, but it is one directional. Okay. So you will see a lot of wonderful Marathi texts are getting translated into English. Quite a few great, many Tamil writers that I know, I've read them in English translation. 
good tamil literature is available to us in english translation so some kind of a homographic sort of transaction is happening only one kind of same transaction it should actually happen the other way also in the sense that whatever great that exists in marathi literature should also be available in tamil literature so there is no particular interaction between the indian languages i mean i i would give you a small sort of experience that you will understand for the young uh, audience particularly when we were uh, in the army cantonment area uh, when i was 12 i was moved to the army cantonment area and in army cantonment area usually when these soldiers are given these quarters the commanding officer and his group of men would often do the inspection of the house how these people are living you know the the military sort of way so i and my mother would always want that our house should be rated as first okay so i remember my mother is very clever she would take me when i was in my 6th standard or 5th standard she would take me to the houses of other soldiers under the pretext of having a cup of tea and when you go to their living room i and my mother would have a duty that was particularly my duty that i should observe the best things that are available in that particular living room how the living room has been arranged and we would come back and we would also try to make those changes in our living room as well and that was the that was the trick that how we always rated first in the inspections in other words i am trying to say that our indian languages must also go to the houses of other sister languages to see what best that they have so it is not about creating a dialogue between tamil and english it is also and that is particularly more important to create a dialogue between tamil and marathi tamil and odia odia and bengali and all and all although we have been talking about it for many years sahitya academy is doing this great work uh, dr thomas is not here otherwise now he has moved away from academy i would have asked if one wants to purchase a book you cannot get that from sahitya academy there is no place where they sell their books translated books you cannot purchase it so it's not about translating it's also about making available what you have translated i have translated a book for sahitya academy but i cannot recommend you the link from where you can get it so this transaction should also happen and the english departments especially these students who are doing english honors i actually consider them to be the best foot soldiers for creating this transaction in both ways unfortunately but it is true that slowly and gradually as a society we officially are forced to turn monolingual gone are the days when we were reading literature and we, we we would get to know that this writer knew seven languages this writer knew eight languages now the kind of google play store that you have without even knowing a language you can survive you can go wherever you want so english departments are in a better position in the sense that those people who do english studies they acquire good skills in english and they are also equally proficient in their own language for example a, a girl who is doing her ba in english honors or ma in english is good enough to operate in english but her tamil is also very good <clears throat> that is not the luxury that a person who is doing say a marathi ma marathi or ma odia that person usually doesn't carry that luxury so in that sense this decolonization of our translation practice where only we are taking our 
great works into english that decolonization must begin with the students of english literature first english literature departments have been the most colonized departments in the country i have been saying it repeatedly i have been a victim of it so if you want to take translation as a vocation you have to be particularly aware about this particular stance second is why you want to translate of course one is that you have said that it it moves you the text has moved you and all that why you want to translate there could be two reasons for that one is that you translate something for mercenary reasons you translate for money and other is that you translate for either pleasure or political commitments or ideological commitments that also you have to decide if it is possible in the very beginning what kind of translator you wish to become i will give you a very small example uh bhimshen joshi ji wrote his autobiography in marathi and one translator was approached when that translator read the autobiography he or she realized that bhimshen joshi ji actually married twice and out of these two wives one is heavily criticized in the autobiography and i mean as a reader you get that she has been given a very unfair treatment by the person who was writing that autobiography <clears throat> now as a discerning reader how could it happen that for all my miseries i always blame tarik tarik khan ji that tarik khan ji is responsible for all my miseries this is against logic this is against good human understanding so as a translator you could also be perturbed by you may not agree with the text that you are reading you may not agree with certain the way certain characters have been treated so in that sense what you do if you are a mercenary translator for you it doesn't matter who is treated in what way you will go ahead with your translation but for a committed translator for an ideological translator i mean i will i'm just giving you a simple example you could also place a political text in this template as well for an ideological text so first of all as a translator you must create a kind of relationship with the text where you are comfortable with the text if you are not comfortable with the text your final output would also be problematic so please ensure that when you are doing it doing a text you are comfortable with it and that comfort level comes when you read the text closely and when you read the text multiple times so the choice of the text is very important quite often we debate in translation studies as to what gets translated <clears throat> in fact what gets translated is not important what gets left behind is the most important question and if ever you try to undertake this field as a field of research i would advise you to go and check the catalog of sahitya academy because whenever a text is awarded a sahitya academy award the text is translated in all official indian languages so what i am trying to say is that when i translated ram darsh mishra text aag ki hasti into english i was frequently talking to him 
and he told me multiple times umesh ji this is not my best trick umesh ji this is not my best trick sir what is your best trick he would tell me the name of three other trick <coughs> but because of the political reasons and because of so many other reasons these text could never get any award and finally when he is awarded sahitya academy at the age of 92 or 93 he gets award for a text that he is not at all comfortable with to be available in english translation because the author thinks that it would actually give a very weak picture of him as a writer but unfortunately or fortunately this is the text that is now available in english translation why because it is a commissioned translation <clears throat> so as a translator you may also be given a commissioned book and when you are translating a book which is commissioned to you usually you do not have many choices but as a young translator if you have to arrive in the field you have to make certain compromises where you can show that you are worth a translation because unless or until you get a chance how could you prove that you are a good translator or the word good is very problematic <clears throat> so initially these choices are also very important you may not have choices you may have choices if you are very lucky right so please be aware that you may be given a text which you have done but may be given a chance after 10 years you would not have liked to do that that would happen it's part of the journey of becoming a translator so the choices you will be confronted with the question of choice what are you translating and what you are not translating sometimes you translate because you are provoked i will give you a very personal example <clears throat> i'm sure you must have heard the name of this very well known hindi writer called premchand premchand wrote some 300 plus story and penguin penguin publishers brought out the complete collection of premchand's short stories in four volumes and it was edited by a well known translator these all these words are in single quotes okay inverted commas well known good all that so edited by a well known translator who is based in aligarh muslim university naturally when you are interested in translated text you get to know that premchand is now available in full fledged form so i got the four volumes and when the books arrived you know usually when the book arrives you open it and you just want to feel it and maybe you want to keep it in the rack never to study that thing kind of so i opened out of these four volumes i opened the book and by sheer stroke of luck the first story that got opened was sava sher gehi so i was very curious i just started to read that sava sher gehi into english because i had read it earlier and i knew the story when i read the story i was really really disturbed and got perturbed i thought that great amount of injustice has been done to shankar's voice shankar is a clear protagonist of samudra and it is an important story because premchand at the end of the story says in hindi that this is not an imaginative story it is a real story and i advise my readers to understand this to be an original episode that i have witnessed so when i read that story i was really this i got disturbed and i wanted to 
do the correction and this is important when you want to evaluate a translation never say it is bad or good do your translation that's the best way to answer a translation that you are not comfortable with in the translation studies that we have now we have reached to a point where qualitative assessment of translation no longer is given due attention so the best way to show your discomfort is to retranslate it so i translated that story and fortunately it appeared in translation today and you would see that <clears throat> my discomfort was that it was not a thick translation t h i c k thick translation it was a very thin translation in penguin as if they wanted to because it was to translate all that what premchand has written in a limited span of time i think the editors and translators also were curious that they have to get all the stories translated so when you are in a hurry there is often a chance that you come up with a bad translation and translation is also like doing a wicket keeping job in a cricket field no you field for 90 overs and if you drop a catch you are in the news so with full credit to what the editors and translators have done at penguin as a reader i was really disturbed to read that story and i have read only one story so there are other 299 stories so you can look at my attempt uh, by googling translation today's journal and that story has appeared there and the kind of intervention that i have attempted to do there by giving a thick description to the because that's a political story it is not a story for entertainment unfortunately the translator did not understand what was the purpose of that particular story so as a translator you must also discern the purpose of the text unless or until you understand the purpose of the text it will also not get translated into your translation so the purpose of the text was missed by the translators here with all due credit to their effort i now in my translation also somebody actually may find some problems and in that sense i am very humbly trying to submit to you that translation is not an act in finality there is no final translation one translation ideally ideally must lead to other translation but unfortunately translation is a very laborious act you would understand it and at least now we have reached to a stage where translators are given due credit but there were times when people were translating without getting anything so we are thankful to our forefathers who kept the tradition formal tradition alive although socially it has always been alive and it could remain so so these are some of the insights that i wanted to give when you to the text you have to be very careful why you are choosing a text what is the purpose of choosing the text when what are you also competent enough to do that text? because sometimes in enthusiasm and over enthusiasm you may feel that okay the story has really moved you but you are not competent to do do that so a certain kind of structure that exists there for example if you are translating a book that has lot of medical vocabulary you know autobiography of a very famous doctor and it has many many sort of sentences that belong to specialized field how you are going to deal with it you must have heard about these actors no who wanted to play a certain role and then they went to that place and they wanted 
to play it perfectly so they were having that attire and uh, you know there was there was a film called masan and the person who played the lead he said that he came to banaras for two months and he was on the ghats and he was looking how people were burning the bodies because he was playing the role of an actor who basically uh, hits the skull when the body is burning you know to uh, get into different pieces so i think that background score must also be undertaken by a translator before you actually plunge into the text because you are also performing the role of somebody that you are not formally you are not a writer you are actually doing the job of a bridge of course you will get these feelings when you are doing it that you are the writer Uh, for example in one of my ma classes one student asked so what if the translation is better than the original always a possibility what would you say my gut response was that if the translation is better than the original then it might not be a translation it, it may be something else it might not be a translation so uh, i think uh, i i don't know whether we can do some uh, psychological analysis of a translator because i feel that translators who are really well known for their translated works must also be having a very balanced sort of personality i don't know whether your own personality also gets translated when you are translating a text i will give you a very small example again i'll take you back to premchand so the title of premchand's story was sava ser gehu gehu means wheat sava ser is the unit of measurement but when i read the story again uh, before translating it to in, into english i realize that premchand has done injustice with the title premchand has done an injustice to himself by giving a very relaxed sort of a title although the story is not about measuring some quantity of wheat it is about injustice it is about a structural slavery that has existed in our society against the farmer a wonderful film that i was looking and uh, thankful it is a tamil film i think uh, asuran where uh, dhanush is playing the lead so there has been a structural injustice to the farmers and the story exposes that so when i read the story i realized that the title has to be tinkered so you will see that my title is the bond of slavery it is not the literal translation which has happened in the penguin collection where it says quarter share of wheat so as a budding translator you must intervene where your intervention is needed so by putting it as the bond of slavery i am not doing an injustice to the text i am not over qualifying it i am just bringing in a title which very much gets resonated with the plot and the structure of the story so a friend of mine who read the story he called me and he said mm you have read jyotiba phule's slavery that's why you have put their bond of slavery <laughs> now i didn't say much but i realized that that was the subconscious of me working there that's why i'm saying that the personality of the translator whatever the translator has read or imbibed the experiences of the translator also get reflected in the final output of the translate translated text although it is very it is not tangible but it 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 works that way that's my experience as a translator that sometimes without you knowing you also 
come in there somewhere but i would advise that you be judicious about your arrival and your departure and do not arrive without traveling okay do not arrive without traveling so you have to arrive by traveling so don't go overboard please understand the context please understand the structure where you are putting yourself as an interventionist in that sense so this is about the text and the translator now another important thing is that how do you put up your proposal as a translator one is of course the commission thing the commission work would come to you if certain tarik khan knows you certain gridhar pp knows you the commission work may come but the commission work will not come to a new translator how how then you would get yourself visible now i have you know accepted it multiple times that the story that i translated of prem chan when it was published in the translation today many people read it and the later commissioned work that i did for that i have been doing is the fall out of that story that i did there okay now take up something which you can do with diligence and you try to start with smaller steps okay so i did a story i sent it to translation today because translation today is open to new Uh, translators as well it does not have any hierarchy if your translation is good if the text is good they will publish it so my humble suggestion would be that when you begin as a translator do not begin with very lofty sort of uh, ideas that i would get published from penguin or uh, harper collins or you know something you can actually take very small small steps and try to locate places that publish small translated material for example there is a journal called modern poetry okay. five or six poems of a writer you can translate and send it to them when you get into the field when you are honest in your work and when you are trying to do something meaningful eventually people will take notice of you please understand that in india we have a great dearth of competent translators so this is a green field in that sense there is no competition if you are honest and sincere so you have to start with simple simple things and please understand that there is a template even if you want to put your work to a good publisher okay just don't do a window shopping that gives a very bad view of you as a as a translator <clears throat> recently we were doing a seminar in university of east anglia and there was this publisher from uh, seagull uh, which is based in kolkata i think kishore some kishore and he was saying that uh, we actually every day we get 100 emails where people send some random things that they have translated and they want us to publish that i am saying that you must expose yourself to the field of practicing translators when you are ready don't do it just in the flux of a movement uh, because that would create a very bad image of you and before you really start translating and i am just saying it to you because all of you are doing your graduation please 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 get hold of the classics of the world literature my own experience is that the more you read the better you become as a translator because eventually when you are reading you are exposing yourself 
to the best of sentence constructions to the best of emotional sort of explanations so please understand that you expose yourself to the best literature like for example if you want to translate fiction please ensure that you are reading the best fiction that the world of literature has to offer and not only read the fiction in the source language but also in the target language in other sense what i am trying to say is that if you are trying to translate something from tamil to english if you are trying to translate tamil short story into english short story then you must be fully equipped with the genre of short story in tamil and also with the genre of short story in english you must create equal competence not only with the story particular but also with the tradition of that particular genre so for example if i am doing a short story i need nothing but the short stories in that language that i want to translate because what happens when you read many short stories in english then you also get to know that what kind of structure what kind of cosmos that the english short story carries and what kind of structure and cosmos the tamil short story is carrying so it's not about just getting familiar with the source text and the target text you must also get familiar with the tradition of that particular genre and you will find that that would have a very massive sort of impact the way your final output comes just to give you a small idea as to what all you should do i'll just share a document with you uh, although i can also email it to the organizers uh, there is not much time to i hope it opens is it visible it's visible yes 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 it's visible okay so these are some of the guidelines for the budding translators uh, how you can actually uh, get into print and i will share it with the organizers but just to so you have to you know first check the language rights of the the text that you want to translate you know, any language you can put any language here in front of english okay so you have to see that the language rights are available because we are living in an age where copyright is actually a very big issue okay so you have to be very careful that any text that you are trying to translate is the intellectual property of somebody okay even if the writer is dead uh, the intellectual property right is resting with his family immediate family or somebody so please ensure that you Uh, have the rights before you get into translating more then uh, rose also the person who has written this document also pin points how you can find the potential publishers and please understand that <clears throat> you also keep a track of what is getting translated in your language okay so you must also identify certain journals and certain platforms that talk about uh, these books which are coming in translation for example in the indian context uh, there is a wonderful journal that i regularly read is the book review okay so the book review also brings out uh, maybe one or two issues in a year especially dedicated to translated books okay so you must also you know be aware about the pulse of translation exercise that is underway in your language and you should read you should read more translated books in the languages that you want to translate in or translate into because that also gives you a better idea as to how people are translating 
you always have models for everything you know the best books uh, that have been ever translated you want to read them you want to read how the translator has gone about his or her work there so in a way i'm also trying to suggest that uh, before getting into translation you must also have your model templates who are your ideal translators whose translation you really enjoy reading what is the method that they use what is the process that that translator employs all these things must also be on your mind when you are getting into translation of course these are some of the professional sort of tips where uh, if you want to approach somebody uh, as an individual translator if you want to approach uh, a publisher uh, these are some of the things that you must uh, take into account so that the possibility of your pitch uh, being read by the editor increases enhances okay so these are some of the things that i would share with the organizers and uh, it talks about literary uh, uh, books and also talks about uh, book proposals for non fiction okay so uh, don't worry about it i will share it with the organizers if you want to have a look at it uh, you should also be aware about the uh, potential threats for being a translator and i would end my talk by reminding you on that front because we are living in a society which is uh, is very sensitive nowadays about everything so for example when uh, paramula murgan wrote that book uh, in tamil uh, it was accepted by the readers but when it came into english translation it created a storm where the writer has to come in public and say that i am dead and uh, you know what happened so i am primarily giving an example from the tamil literary sphere because i am aware that you must be aware of that episode where uh, morgan was heavily censored and criticized Uh, in in spite of the fact that his book was uh, well received in tamil when it appeared in tamil but the english translation translation created the uh, major problem so be aware of what you choose and uh, choose your risks carefully you know sometimes uh, risk also depends upon whether you can afford that risk right so risk also depends upon your affordability okay so with this i think i can uh, uh say that i'm on uh, for the day with respect to the time although there are, you can go on and on and we translators have this knack of speaking sometimes without making any sense also thank you so much